right. Uh, glad that you're all here. So yeah, my talk is going to be about when to use machine learning. Uh, first, something about myself, the, who am I? I've studied method and statistics, uh, a research master, and um, during that time I got really interested in uh, machine learning. So even though I was focusing on statistics in my study, I was really interested in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm also an Intel AI uh, innovator. Um, what I love is uh, open source innovation and particularly human machine interaction. Uh, so how can um, computers help empower people? Um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank Jibes for enabling me to speak here today. I'm a senior data scientist there. I've been working there for almost four years at 15 different companies. Um, Jibes itself has 35 data scientists. And in my four years, I've worked on uh, blockchain, uh, a social robot from which you can see the picture, um, natural language processing, for example, chatbots, or uh, analyzing the news, like Reddit or Twitter, and uh, a lot of purely machine learning predictive uh, and uh, yeah, kind of projects. So, usually I say something about the open source projects that uh, I've done, but I want to keep them for the talk, actually. So, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Gartner's hype cycle. It's an interesting one to follow because yeah, they're discussing which thing, like where are things in the trends uh, with tech. And uh, this is where you can find me. So, I like to do these kind of innovation topics. And, um, I also have GitHub, and so yeah, you can already have a look there. Um, so today, I want to first uh, try to explain uh, what machine learning exactly is, and then not from like formulas perspective, but like just to get you, give you an intuition. Um, so no formulas, um, and afterwards I will tell you when to use machine learning because it's not. You shouldn't always use it, like that's a spoiler. Um, yeah, I'm sure that a lot of you already have ideas what it might be or have applied it, you know, um, cloned some GitHub code or, uh, and then just run some example code or maybe a bit further than that. Um, but yeah, I, ho I hope something of this will be inspiring to you. So let's start with what it is. So this is uh, an example where we have like the simplest possible data. It's uh, kind of sociology data. That was my, uh, my ironically, my, uh, um, my major. Um, so I guess, uh, does anyone want to guess what the, what the number should be there? Or like what could we predict as people here? Yeah, I think that it's pretty clear to see immediately like that's, that's what we would think. And, um, well, that, so yeah, that's that's indeed like what a, a computer, what you would like a computer also to predict, right? I mean, we we have this intuition, but how how can a computer uh, learn that? So you want it basically, you want a computer to be able to generalize from the examples. So it would, for example, learn on the first three examples and be able to generalize to other examples that it hasn't seen before. So. In, the, in this example, uh, you, you would train on the first three and you would hope that it can predict the other two, right? So you, let's say this is your whole data set. You're going to split it up and then you would learn on one part and validate your model on the, on the other part. And actually I wanted to show you this also, the example in, in Python code. Uh, let's see how the switching is going. All right, so I don't know who of you is familiar with scikit-learn, but it's, an, uh, it's a very good library which helps you yeah, develop machine learning models. And it popularized the fit, transform, and fit predict. So like, as long as you're still kind of making a pipeline, you're doing trans fit and transform, so you learn how to apply like, 
because, like for example, with the age and the income, it's kind of a function that you're trying to learn, right? You're, you have an argument, someone's age, and then you try to predict the, the, uh, the income. And uh, scikit-learn uh, yeah, is really good for this kind of like, stuff where you want to train on some data, and then, uh, yeah. So, I don't know if it's readable. I guess I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, so, let's first then create some data. And this is usually how you name the variables. So, the x is what goes in. And y is what you want to predict. Sorry? <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> so, can you evaluate it? And so this is, this is how the variable would look like. And the y variable. Looks correct, right? So now we make a model. And the idea is that you fit it on the data. Uh, so you want the first three examples, you want to learn, learn on that. And then you can predict the rest. So yeah, what you can see here is you're, you're using the first three examples, then you're predicting the last one. So yeah, this is like a way to learn a linear uh, relationship. But the interesting thing is that in machine learning, there are a lot of different ways that you can have a, a model. And this is the simplest variation where, you know, like numerical data. And you will basically, any model will have some kind of special like features that it learns, some parameters that that's the thing that you're trying to learn. So here you can see that the value is 1,000, which means if you multiply the age by 1,000, you'll get income. All right. So actually, the interesting thing is, of course, what would it do for numbers that it hasn't seen? And in this case, it will, yeah, it, if you say 70, it will predict 70,000, obviously. Okay, so this was a numerical example. Now, kind of an idea of, like, decision trees, which you, you can draw always, like, if, if this, then, uh, then that. And there's two things here. Um, like, this makes it so that you can have nonlinear uh, kind of, like transformations or predictions. And um, in the end, you're predicting here yes or no. That's like not a numerical value, so that's also possible. And um, another example is for, of those is, uh, is predicting spam. So, hi, John, how are you? We would say that that's not spam, and clink, clink for free, that, that might be spam. Um, unless your name is John, then probably also the first one is spam. Um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, rather than, like, what could we use machine learning for? Rather than write a lot of if-else statements, you can learn ba uh, logic based on the existing input-output uh, examples. So the steps here are, like, find a problem, do some pre-processing. In our example, we didn't have to do any. Um, find a model that works, and then use this best model in production. So now I want to bring your attention to the following, the significance of machine learning. I don't know if you guys know Venn diagrams, uh, but you know this is uh, this is how machine learning is, you know, or or actually, I think it's more like this. Like machine learning is just a, a small part in this, right? You like you want to automate some process, and machine learning can be part of that. So now it's time to go to the examples.
Yeah, so this is uh, a library that I uh, put online, and um, I wanted to explain to you how I came uh, to this idea. Um, I had installed Arch Linux on my MacBook. I would not recommend that. It's like a, <laughs> it's a horrible idea. Um, yeah, don't try it at home. Um, but at, at night, programming at night, I've noticed that there's difference uh, between the like between the colors. So you have those that are trying to you know you know it's it's dark, uh, so it will apply some like orangey filter. I never got used to that one. Um, but what I noticed was that the browser, which is mostly white, was still really bright compared to when I looked at my editor, which was really black. So I thought you know it would be cool to kind of take that into account, and. Um, I also thought like it would be cool if instead of having like a lot of configuration, that it would be cool if uh, if you would have actually no configuration at all, and it, and you would be able to still like um, like be able to do something about it. So um, yeah, this is example data of the BrightML that it takes and. Maybe it's fun to show it. I'm not really happy about switching because it's a bit slow, but so yeah, that's a new version, right? Then you always get these, uh, these things. So whenever I switch between a, a screen, you can see that it applies new brightness. Like at the, uh, for example, the last one is 73. And going back to I don't know if it's visible on this screen. I guess not. Now it starts doing it. <laughs> okay, well, it's mostly designed for a laptop, so I only experienced here if it would work on external monitor. But the idea is that uh, yeah, you need to collect features that can help you predict it. And um, these are the ones that I've got. So you, you see here the new brightness. That's like. Um, when I'm raising the, uh, the brightness on my computer, it changes this value. It's a file, actually, uh, on your computer. And that changes. And whenever uh, a change is being made to that, then it's being recorded. And it records these kind of features. So my battery uh, power level, which application I'm, I'm in, but also that, that pixel value that I wanted. So that's like a value between 255 and zero, right? So the idea is I want to have a model that could potentially learn the difference between um, you know, high values, low values. And um, maybe the time is important, right? Maybe location. And last one, ambient light. That's like the sensor in your laptop. That's also a useful feature here, of course, because yeah, that already does some kind of like, are we in the dark or not? Um, so I had a question, like, does anyone else have ideas, like what you would want to use as input here? Well, I, I guess I got quite some here, but yeah, you can, yeah. I, uh, I actually found out one more yesterday, which was when I was, uh, when I was boarding the plane and I couldn't charge my laptop anymore. Uh, I know it has a bad battery because I'm running Arch Linux on a MacBook, which you shouldn't do. Um, so I would have only like, uh, an, like 45 minutes battery or something. And even though my battery was completely full, I still did not want, I still wouldn't want my brightness to like, you know, be full. But from the model's perspective, it's going to be like, yeah, you know, no problem with battery. <laughs> let's just, uh, uh, you know, let's just do full uh, brightness uh, because it's day. So, yeah. It's a bit of a contradictory example, right? Um, and as a person, you would be able to, like you can learn it, but it's not going to generalize, because when I'm ever going to be again in that situation, it's going to be so rare, and this is one of the main problems with machine learning, these kind of rare situations. Um, so yeah, the main takeaway here, actually, I didn't mention it yet, but the cool thing about it is, I don't have to do anything other than just change the brightness like normal, and over time, I should just notice that I need to change it less and less, right? So that's, the, that's really the cool part. You don't have to do this whole process of collecting data and whatever. You know, I want to change it. It will work for that time. You, you, you go to a different situation. Um, so it's zero config, but it's still personalized. And um, I think that's really cool about it. Um, 
But the thing is still, you have to think about like which features are available and which do I want to use. But hopefully, you know, this would allow people to create their own brightness setting without too much effort. And brings me to my next one, um, which is another library. So it uses a Wi-Fi signal to detect where you are. And um, here we go. Let's do it here. Um, Euro Python Fintry. Let's see if it works. So I have it here. See? It's in my bar, so my computer knows where it is. And um, I think it's cool because this one is using a smaller module that I've made just to get like, like just to give an idea of uh, uh, how it works. So it, it uses the scanner and you have like a lot of Wi-Fi inputs, like some ideas, and how strong your signal is. So that's kind of how this one works is um, if you're sitting on your couch or you're being somewhere else in the house, uh, the computer could know the difference because this, the signal strengths are going to be different between the different access points that you have. And the interesting thing here again is that um, oh, is that don't take pictures when there's an empty slide. <laughs> uh, 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 no problem. Um, so the cool thing here is when we look at this one, is actually using it. So I really like this idea of creating small models that you can then use in, in like other things. And I think that that's, just, that's where we have to go with machine learning, create small models that then can be reused in, in other components. Because I do think that you know, where I am is actually going to be a, a, a factor in, in how your brightness would want to be, or I mean, it can be predictive of it. So, plugability is key. And, um, well, one of the ideas is easier to learn from the observ uh, observation than to have to say something, if my signal strength uh, is this much, you know, like, I don't, no one wants to do that, right? That's, like, really crazy. Um, so, <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, um, yeah, so I've told you how to solve some kind of X to Y problems, right? some input to some numerical value or some like class. And so you can only solve these kind of problems, some X to Y problems. It's uh, pretty, pretty limited, you would think, but uh, people have been very creative in posing their problems as X to Y problems, actually. So for example, in computer vision, and what would be any respectable presentation without a seemingly off-topic picture? Um, so, this is, a, this is an example of the Im ImageNet uh, data set. And it's something like, they, I think they noticed, I think they were predicting dogs and they looked at which ones were wrongly predicted and then they saw this. I mean, it's, I think it's very, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but how, does, how, how would you use this in a model, right? How, how did they do it? Well, it's like different classes. In this case, is it a dog or is it not a dog? Uh, zero or one, one is a dog, and on the other hand, you have pixels, and this is the crazy part. You have for every image, you have like 80 pixels by 80 pixels by three uh, channels, like red, green, blue, and like that is something like, I think like it was like 19,000 or something data points, so you have to imagine each of those is a value between zero and 255. It makes it that you immediately have big data with some sizable number of images. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's an idea of on computer vision. And so I want to also talk about one, uh, one case at, you know, from work. I've worked for multiple insurance companies. And um, in one of them, we wanted to investigate what computer vision could do for them. And in this case, they wanted to predict the amount of damage, like how much it would cost to, to repair it from uh, damaged car pictures. And, um, well, it took a really long time to get this data because obviously they have not prepared for it to be used like this. Uh, so we started working with uh, academic uh, car data. And so pretty much, yeah, 
like this is an easy one, but they have examples where you have like a tiny scratch and, and it's very difficult to see like the very small feature on the whole thing. Um, so we started with, yeah, we, also, we, we actually made it a bit easier, this problem for ourselves, like more on, on like sides of the car, like this as a start. So we were trying to predict which side of the car are we looking at, and then you would, yeah, yeah. so it's kind of about localization, and we, we, I, I did this uh, over two years ago. Um, but yeah, it's a good case because it's, you know, it's very time consuming in a way. Um, and so, but the problem is, is they don't, didn't have enough data, you know, and the cool thing is though, um, there's something called transfer learning where you're, you can use like an existing model. Uh, we, at that time we used the Inception V2 model from, uh, from Google. They were training it for like three months on like uh, 30,000 euro uh, <laughs> machinery, something like that. And the idea is that they, they, like, they made this whole network and only actually this like last <laughs> red one on the completely on the right is the actual pr prediction is happening like you know this is a this is and in that case they use the image net so it's like this is a dog this is a car this is you know a lot of like I think a thousand different classes but the cool thing is the part before that very la uh, last one that can still be reused in other cases so in our cases so features that are useful to help the dogs might not be that useful but you know uh, there's always some kind of features that it will learn to represent this whole data, to learn this whole data set that you can use in another task. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very interesting project. It was when TensorFlow was 0 0.8 and um, we, we made a, or we used our template to create an Android app. We changed it so it would accept our model. And so uh, it's still fun to, to walk around and project it on cars and have a laugh every now and then. Um, Yeah, so what is typical in an insurance company is like they have strict, strict rules already in place. So that, yeah, this was innovation, so that's, uh, that's one part there. Uh, transfer learning can certainly help, but you know, like image data, it's, it's a very difficult one. And I think I missed this point earlier. Um, we advised them not to continue on this one because it was not their core business, this car. Like that was just one of their things. Like we're a very broad uh, insurance company. And we advised against, you know, going forward with this because it's just not their main, like their call thing. And it would be very expensive to get to label all their data and, and, and like that. So, um, and uh, another thing is like, you know, you're going to have a difficult one with, uh, with, with like compliance where you're going to be like, you know, 60% of the time it's, uh, it's accurate. Like compliance doesn't really like that. So, um, I wanted to go to another complex problem. I don't want to go too, depth, uh, too much into depth in this one, but I thought it would be fun to have a neural network learn to complete neural network code. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of generative models out there. So you you just give it a bunch of text, and it will learn to predict the next word or character based on the the things that it has seen before. So there's a generative model, and um, yeah, it can be very generic. It can be time uh, time data, or it can be like text or uh, or image images even. Um, but I don't want to go too much into depth about this one. Um, I think that gener generating in company bi uh, is not that interesting usually, um, unless you're making really that to be your thing. Like, for example, I think it's amazing what kind of art they make. Like, Google made something called uh, deep dreaming or something. It's, it's very interesting art. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these are just like inspirational ideas. It's not really, I wouldn't really recommend uh, like this as your next, uh, project, though it, it can be interesting, of course. Um, so next one, I don't know who here has cryptocurrency at the moment. Okay, everyone sold it off already, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so um, this is actually my only uh, personal closed source code. Um, and. Um, Actually, three years ago, I was working on uh, blockchain, and at th those times, I was also a bit skeptical of it. I'm still quite skeptical of, of blockchain. Um, but yeah, I was always laughing when companies were, were saying something like, um, 
yeah, we're combining AI, IoT, and blockchain, and this is going to be the, the, the thing, you know, like, like now you have like three problems instead of like <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but yeah, and those teams are also, well, I didn't have a lot of money, and I thought it was also going to be way too expensive to trade these things, like thinking about stock where, you know, it doesn't make any sense unless you have really big volumes. Um, and that there are already way too many people doing it. Um, but actually, a few months ago, I thought, you know, let's just collect data and let's analyze some of it. And, you know, most of the models, uh, like the popular ones, then they apply the latest machine learning techniques, hoping that it's, you know, it's going to give them an edge. So basically what they're just doing is take this, like, price data over time, and they hope that they're able to predict, like, if it's going up or it's going down. So that's what most people are doing. I thought, I, I wanted to do it for, for some time, but I thought, you know, yeah, that's not, that's not really, like, that's really risky, or, you know, I don't have anything to say about, <laughs> I cannot control anything, it's, it's going to be, you're going to wake up and anything can happen. Um, um, so, yeah, I thought, you know what, I'm going to analyze the data, and I'm going to see, like, what are the most obvious things, like, uh, I noticed at one moment that a coin was like one of the coins was going to work together with uh, with with Microsoft, and that really increased the price enormously. So I thought, you know what? If I'm just going to monitor for such events, those things that you know ever, it's going to be obvious for everyone that the price is going up. You know that maybe I can do something with that. So just make something very simple. There's no need to always try to to do the most complicated machine learning model. And I can also assure you that it's a good experience to have your personal money on the line. Like, uh, yeah, it's a good experience in the sense of uh, uh, when you lose some money, then you're really <laughs> going back and like you will make sure that you're really doing good monitoring there. Um, and yeah, another big point here is that you don't need machine learning to create training and test sets uh, or run simulations, right? So machine learning is just one part, just running simulations is where you know, like the things that I'm doing is like, you know, just two values or something I'm trying to find. It's not, not based on machine learning. And uh, a lot of just, yeah, uh, you do tests backwards, but it's not, it's not necessarily machine learning. Um, yeah, don't underestimate the work necessary next to machine learning. I didn't bring that up, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it takes so long before, yeah, because you're uh, depending on uh, the exchanges to to trade and you know from idea to um, to actually have the uh, to have something like that working it, it takes a long time and um, yeah you can also do analysis sometimes instead of like forcing it to be machine learning and uh, uh, for the Python for Python right like simple can be better than complex it, it also holds for uh, for machine learning or modeling or of any kind um, so another one that I made is X to Y. I gave a talk about that also be, uh, sometime earlier. And it's the idea of automating this, these, these steps of like, because a lot is, you know, you have some data, you do some kind of pre-processing on it, like missing, dealing with missing values, because otherwise it doesn't, uh, scikit-learn cannot deal with it. Um, and you do model selection. And I mean, in the end, after you've done a lot of like different projects, you, you have a kind of, you start to like a couple of models, you know when to apply them. If you just throw them together, well, you get, uh, you get if you throw this together, then you get something like uh, X to Y. And so, So I'm loading that library, of course, and reading in some data. I think it's this. So that looks like this. Yep. It's one of, it's actually my favorite data set, to be honest. <laughs> it's like uh, who survived uh, the Titanic, they collected that, and so you can say something about like, uh, did, uh, did uh, 
women indeed uh, like were the, was the captain last standing or these kind of you know these these ideas but um, yeah women did have a better chance so that's uh, that's good right um, I'm thinking that we don't have the most time anymore but let's see how far we get um, so I'm going to get you the data again uh, survived So that's like one is survival, zero is not sur survived. And um, we have to remove this, like. So now it's not there anymore. And then we can say, okay, same pattern as before. Except now we're like, this is kind of messy data. There's missing values, there's text and whatever, and scikit-learn cannot deal with that. So the idea was, you know, let's just do something that's very simple. There's also it's similar to the example code, but what, what you can say is like, let's fit on half of the data. That's for people that don't know, like that's how you can get half. Uh, it's a simplification. So now it's training. And then you can use it to predict. So there we go. Then you can compare if the predictions are actually equal to so in this case we got seventy seven percent correct um, skipped over those okay yeah, yeah so the idea here is um that you know you have um, you have image data, time series, text data, and you know there's so much that you have to do like pre-processing if you just start again. It's nice to kind of bundle things, and and this is kind of the thing that I also would recommend to companies um, make like this kind of a platform that does this kind of pre-processing for your common uh, things, right? If you're uh, concerned with churn, then um, make sure that you're like the main things that can be predictors of that are actually <laughs> going to be there. Take already care of pre-processing, cross-validation, and like what is going wrong with my data. You can do that all. And um, yeah, deal with your core domain features. And I mean, only the final step is actually the models. So, you know, like just bundle it. And if you can make quick iterations, like that's that's going to help you like in a company. So then you can see, okay, we're missing data or let's add this data and it, it will be very quick. So it's important. But then of course there's always production. So I mean, that's like a next step there. So that, that always takes more time, like compliance, uh, like proper development cycle. So make sure that you all have that as well. Okay, so gave a lot of, uh, I threw a lot your way. Um, let's uh, let's wrap it up. In the end, machine learning is just a tool, but it can be really powerful <laughs> in the right circumstances, like learning this kind of function between your input and something that you want to predict. But it's not more than that, right? So it's not <laughs> like that's some people don't really understand that they think out everything is going to be automatic with machine learning. Um, you have to do a lot of work around it. Think or ask yourself, is it easy to create a feed loop, feedback loop here? Or if you have to do a lot of effort to create this like new data, new annotated data where you get the answer, right? Like if you cannot collect income data, then it doesn't matter if you have age and it's a good predictor, which is, yeah. So this is a very important one. Yeah, don't forget to think yourself like what could be useful features, right? Um, it's a bit of a simple one, but yeah. Also, I think pluggability is key. Don't try to solve everything in one model. Make different models and spread out the problem. Uh, and I think actually that it's going to be very interesting to see what in the next few years people are coming up with models that you can then use in your model. Because, you know, if you look at OpenCV and computer vision, they can do facial detection and these kind of things, but it took a long time for people to, um, yeah, to, to, to build this. And, um, but once we have these kind of models for machine learning, it will be nice to chain them together. Um, 
and don't try to solve the most complex problems. If, you, if, it's, if it's like way too complicated data or you know, like there's so many rules, then you know, just start with something easier. Like, especially when many strict rules are, are there, like insurance companies, banks, you know, they have so many strict rules. If you cannot explain it, if you cannot, uh, you know, cannot reason why you're doing it, or if it's obviously wrong why you're doing it, like <laughs> discrimination or whatever, then it's not going to work. So, and most people find optimizing models fun, you know, get a better score, but, you know, optimizing the model is usually not the best, like, thing to do here. If you have the simplest model, you can still really make big improvements by getting better data or, you know, talking to the people that can help you get better data. So this is also a very important one. And, um, Never underestimate the work required besides machine learning to get it actually in production, right? Like, even if you have the model, you're very happy with it, you know, it's, it takes time to get it to work inside a whole application environment. Um, build a framework in your company. Uh, um, yeah, so um, I wanted to thank you and um, come and say hi. <laughs> uh, if something wasn't clear to you or you want to discuss your own examples uh, or just chit chat, um, I'll be here until Saturday. And my final and most important uh, suggestion is make little projects and then give a presentation about your machine learning projects at the next year of Python. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. We have a few minutes for questions if anyone has any. Have you actually made money on your blockchain project? <laughs> Good question. Um, it, well, I have not lost anything yet. I'm still <laughs> in the like, development phase. And uh, projections are that even if Bitcoin is going down 20% per month, then it should still be OK. So. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Um, there are some cases where pluggability could hurt performance, for example, in the um, lightness prediction model you were showing. Uh, suppose there are like two places that are close by to each other, but uh, you would want very different brightness values for those. And since the prediction is uh, based on classes, like you just predict the place, if it predicts the place incorrectly, it could really hurt the performance of the brightness uh, prediction. So what would you recommend doing in those cases? Um, well, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the, the thing there is, you know, you're, there are so many other features, so you just hope that, you know, the model will learn to prioritize others. So, I mean, if you're afraid that it's going to be uh, messy, this, uh, this prediction, then it's the model eventually will learn that it's like not an important feature, right? So then it wouldn't use it. it it's, you know, I guess in, um, in, in the example of, you know, being at EuroPython or somewhere completely different, then, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's going to learn that that's in that case a good example. But maybe, you know, couch one, couch two, uh, if you want to learn that difference very, very close to each other, uh, yeah. In this case, how it's parameterized, I would expect that it's not going to put too much effort on, like, on this one. So it would just instead focus on, on bright, uh, like, like time or you know the, the, yeah, the pixel value or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else with a question? No. Okay. Um, okay, well, the next talk is in here at 10 past 12. Uh, can we say thank you again to our speaker? Thank you.